So this is a sort of best practices and things. When you do things with data, you try to analyze it. There's a very high level four steps that you do. The first thing is you bring data in, traditionally in data warehousing and so forth. We call it uh, the word ETL, a very cryptic word, ETL. It stands for extraction, transformation, and loading. What it means is you first take all your data. Now, well, that word is older. It predates big data. But in this world, roughly speaking, you can interpret it to mean the following. You take in data in whatever form you get. The, the, the crucial thing is just get it. And sometimes just getting it is important because uh, sensor data and a lot of data, it's coming streaming at you like a fire hose. Right? And you, it's just a challenge to get it, to just capture it and put it into your data lake. Once you put it and pour it into your data lake, and sometimes you don't even get that chance. Sometimes you have a situation that we are facing today in which you're told, analyze this data as this huge torrential river of data flows past you. Make predictions, describe it, generate analytical reports as this huge river flows by you. That's sort of the cutting edge. It's the streaming data analytics that we are doing. But let's say for a moment that we take data in into our big data lake. Right? What do we do with the data? You always, all journeys start with this. You want to, and you want to build something called multidimensional cubes. What does it mean? Let's say that you have a department. You want to know uh, for the Department of Motor Vehicles as government, for the location of Sacramento, right? Let's these employees, you want to find something about these employees. Let's measure them, right? Number of holidays they have taken, or their productivity, or something like that, I don't know. Or, or anything you want to do. Now, what have you done? From all sets of people, you have sliced and diced it to a very limited cohort. In other words, you have now narrowed it down to a very specific cohort. How many such cohorts are possible, or cuboids are possible? Arbitrarily large, huge number because you can slice and dice the data in so many, many ways. Each of these ways is called a dimension in technical space, but think of it in common sense. There's so many ways you can look at it. The question is, it is very easy to do data analysis on the entire data set, paradoxically, because it's one data set. You just need more power to do it. It gets harder when you look at every specific context, isn't it? The, but. The magic is in finding out specifically what's happening on, in your department, in your location, isn't it? That's where decision making should happen. But when you look at these keywords, there's so many of this. You have a combinatorial explosion of this. You have literally millions or hundreds of millions of keywords. The current uh, situation that I'm, for example, dealing with, we are dealing with three billion cuboid in a particular situation. And each of them we analyze, we generate reports for, we mine, we do machine learning algorithms on. So it's, it's just a, like the scale of it is unbelievable, what we are facing these days. So that is that. You, you, you build cuboids out of it. Then what do you do with this data? Now you have created very specific uh, data sets. This location, this department and this position or whatnot. Now what do you do? You ask questions. Now is the time to ask meaningful questions. What's happening there? What are you trying to measure? Right? And you measure that. Yes, you measure that. You produce reports. You produce visualizations. We learn a lot simply by visu visualizing the data in meaningful ways, by creating derived measures and things like that. Uh, it's, it's amazing how bright our eyesight is as a faculty. We sometimes look at a situation. It's a massively parallel computing engine. In the blink of an eye, we know what it is. Like, it doesn't take you, uh, for example, when you see a line, right? You don't, in your head, see a spinning wheel as you see on your laptop. Please wait. Wait. Maybe a line. It, it doesn't work like that. You instantly start running, isn't it? it it's, it's because cognition and a vision and cognition. It happens a massively a parallel engine. You instantly get it. And you want to leverage that. Right? When you visualize data, you create this evocative uh, 
graphs and pictures and you show it in a way that is not idle artistry. It is storytelling with data, it's bringing up narratives, it's giving the human eye and the human cognition a chance to grasp what exactly is going on in this world. With this data, what is going on? And that has become tremendous because the scale of the data has become tremendous. So visualization then kicks in. And then the last thing is that we are in a world in which we can make massive amounts of pattern recognitions and predictions. It's the world of machine learning and AI. Can we predict what's going to happen? Can we, can we for anything, what, how many accidents will happen at this intersection if I have these many traffic lights? Right? What factors are responsible for that? What can I change? What are the knobs we can change? If I have this much budget to improve upon a situation in any context, which factor is most effective? Where should I go and spend it? Which is the optimal way to do it? What patterns are we recognizing? So machine learning is, is a form of, uh, it's a very useful tool. I'll give an example. If you walk around the street here, you see a local bit. You see this street, it intersects some other street, and you get some mental picture of where you are. But were I to put you in a hot air balloon, what would happen? We would go up, and in one shot, you would get a pattern would emerge, isn't it? That would show you the structure of the city. And each city has a unique structure. And that structure is learning. That structure contains a lot of information that you can use thereafter to do other things, city planning, whatnot, isn't it? So that's the domain of machine learning or AI. It is capable of extracting patterns where human beings can't venture anymore because the spaces, the dimensions of the data is extremely large. Right? Or when you're trying to deal with uh, making causative, the causative factors are like in the hundreds. Many small, small factors are affecting something. And you're trying to figure out, how, do, how in the world do I predict what is going to happen? Right? There are too many factors. Simple rules of thumbs don't work. That's when machine learning comes in and it does an extraordinary job of it. So we really are in the century of machine learning and AI. It's the biggest revolution that we are in the part of. But all these algorithms, they need data for food. Unfortunately, we are drowning in data. Right? So that's sort of the journey. So again, how does data come? There's data that's already there in your data silos, in your databases, and so forth. And then data that comes real life, real time, streaming at us, the two forms of data. We build millions of queues, we visualize the data, we look for predictive. Now, what is this whole journey of learning from data? It's very interesting. You make a data, I call it the heart of science. In science, what do you do? You ask a question, you go measure, you learn, and then you learn something and you get more data and you try to learn something more. You build your next hypothesis. Most of uh, predictive modeling uh, that you do is like that. You take data, you make a hypothesis that these factors are effective. You use machine learning techniques and mathematics to grind through and build a hypothesis. Then your hypothesis may be right or wrong. You go and try it out with new data. You check whether you got fooled by the data that you got. If it stands up the test of time, if it stands up to absolutely new data that your algorithm has never seen and is able to make good predictions on it, then you say, all right, I have a robust model. It is explaining to quite an extent what's happening, and I can use it for prediction. And then you use it for prediction, out of which you'll come out your reports, your predictions, and obviously you can do, you, it feeds into your whole, co uh, whole uh, collection of reports, visualizations, and so forth. So I'll give an example of this two very interesting and different cultures. One culture, I mean, we have data. Like, how does data come alive? It turns out that there are big organizations, Center for Disease Control and uh, World Health Organizations and so forth. And what they do is uh, they are always on the watch out for epidemics because you want to catch those infectious diseases early enough. You have an army of people. The earlier you catch, the less the human cost in suffering and the less the actual cost. It's a government's primary driver is to catch it everywhere as early as possible. So one of the interesting things people did in applying machine learning or applying these techniques is they took this data from the various sources and they applied this new algorithmic world, this, this sort of things. And what emerged here, you see, and this is a, obviously, a, a lot of you may be familiar with this, it's called health map. 
In live dashboard, you see infectious diseases emerge in time and literally very rapidly. Quite often, they are able to see the emergence of disease uh, almost at the same time that CDC or WHO and sometimes even faster. Right? It's just amazing that they notice it, that this mathematics is able to evolve. So this is again an example of the potential of what we can uh, create with data. So now, this is all very nice, but how do we actually practically go about doing it? How do these uh, projects work? Right? So the way it works is, I say, to, ha to have a successful collaboration in a very complex project like Apollo, let's say, it, it, it's certainly not a, a three-month project. It's a huge ambition. A lot of brains of different types come together. I always say that, that great projects needs, needs to be nourished by a lot of talent of very, very different type. That's how it comes about. So in my experience you know, working with large projects, this is what I have found. I find that, found that you always start with people who understand the domain. These are the domain experts. They really know, know the pain points. They know things that are not in books. They know things that are tribal knowledge. You start with these deep experts and you understand, you listen, you get a context of what the problem is. Once you have that, then you get the techies, the guys excited about algorithms. Right? And then how in the world? So you know what is it that you want to solve. That is primary. Then you bring in people who can answer. Can we even solve this? Now increasingly, there used to be, there's a history of it. I remember that in the late 1990s, the situation used to be, the frustration within engineering was that people ask for things that you think is solvable and you say, okay, we can solve it. And then the, the person or the people, the domain experts will slightly change the problem. And they'll say, no, actually, we want this. It's very similar. Can you do this? And the engineers would say, oh my goodness, now the problem has literally gone from a solvable problem to an impossible problem or a, or a 10 year project or something like that. Right? It was very, very easy to go outside the domain of what was actually practically solvable. In the last 20 years, we have seen a remarkable, remarkable empowering of, uh, of the technical tools. And it does not happen as often today when people come with problems, with different things. More often than not, you find some way, maybe you tame down the expectations a little bit to more realistic, but more often than not, you can actually come up with the technical architecture to solve that problem within reasonable, within practical time frames, and within practical resources. That's the most remarkable things. But you have to have absolutely the right brains to do it. Because within technical, just as in everything, within technical world too, there's a variation in quality between the really, really expert people and the people who are a little bit behind times and so, so on and so forth. So what do you do? You create a product. The, the, the experience has been that you bring these two people together. It's a wonderful, wonderful collaboration. Except that it's, a, a, it's really not permanent. Those domain experts need to go do the job, right? Go back to the things. If they're doctors, they need to get back to surgery. Right, and so forth. Likewise, there's uh, technical experts, these geeks, they need to get back to their subject matter and so forth. So they solve this problem, this collaboration is good. But in the process, as you evolve a product, the product has to, two things have to happen. The, the domain experts have to adopt the, the product, which is their intention, of course. That's why they engaged these techies, to get a solution, to get an architecture, to have something to work with for the next few years. But at the same time, what needs to happen is these domain experts need to ramp up on the technical know-how that these techies have, because these techies will be gone, isn't it? So there is a huge training component that has come in, and that's remarkable. No more are the days in which you could say do domain experts are in Silicon Valley, you call them app engineers and tech and so forth, subject matter experts and so forth. They cannot afford to be non-technical anymore. You have to, within your group, groom up a group of people who adopt that technical knowledge because the techies will go away. Right? You bring them up, you train them, and so forth. And the thing with knowledge is, in every field, knowledge is infinite. So you can't, send, uh, you can't say, all right, the domain experts, let's shut down what are our departments. Let's go back, and for four years, we'll attend college in this field. 
right? Obviously, it's not practical, or even for a year, and so forth. So it has to be learning that happens as this is being built. So one of the products, you always are building two products. One is the uh, purported product that you're really building. The other product that you're building is literally the technological depth and maturity of the team, the domain experts that entered into the project. This is the one part that I find that is often missed. If you don't ramp them up, how will they hold on to the baby after that? How will they efficiently run it? It must happen and be given equal importance so that together this whole situation can come through. And then, of course, when you successfully do that, then the techies can go away. They are redundant. They have other exciting things to do. And you, as domain experts, you have the expertise to not only hold on to that, you, have, you start having techie ideas because you just picked up that newfound knowledge. Isn't it? Right? And you start evolving it. So I just see this as the journey of large projects. Right? It is a journey of really two products, the product that you're building and the other product is really a journey of education and learning and getting to know what is it that made this happen. Right? So that's, that's all that I have to say. Uh, I'd like to take questions. This is who we are. You must be wondering, who in the world is this? So uh, th this is uh, the Pyramid, uh, pyramid uh, Group, and they have invited me to give a talk. I, uh, I'm part of Support Vectors, and there's Teja. She is part of Apatex. These folks do a lot of medical fraud detection. This is, again, an example of government data coming together and brains looking at that data and discovering a lot of fraud, remarkably large number of fraud and so on and so forth. So I won't talk more about this, but any questions? Let's have some interesting questions. Yes. First of all, um, thanks for the presentation. It's really engaging. I mean, it's a good presentation style. Um, but I was curious, you mentioned the, um, the, the techie group and the domain knowledge group, yeah. and how you're supposed to bring them together. What's, what's the best way that you've found to bring, that, to bring them together? Is there like a, a, a separate position that's just a facilitator? Yes. That? So in a sense, what you're asking is, how do you herd wild cats? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's always been a challenge. And so here's what, I, what the experience has been. There is an approach that, it is not the perfect approach, but it is the best that we have, that seems to have worked over the years. It is called agile, the agile methodologies. What the, the big tenets of agile methodology is, you first create a group of stakeholders and a group of implementers. And what you do is essentially have a moderator, a scrum master, and they, they, there's a whole bit of jargon that goes along with it. You have that. Its first rule is that it must checkpoint, it must meet and do something called stand-ups. Those are very short meetings, preferably every day, or maybe at least every two, three days. The idea is that you must catch things getting derailed as soon as possible. Right? So, and the stand-up's idea is literally that we all get together in a room, in a fixed time, in a fixed place, we just stand there. That's not the point to have deep philosophical discussions. We just get in checkpoint, do we all know what we are doing, this is what we are doing, that's what you are doing. The stakeholders get to speak on whatever uh, things have happened yesterday, right, and so forth. So what happens is the whole development process happens in a very, very transparent way. More importantly, the cross-fertilization uh, of ideas keeps taking place. Because uh, people, when they go technical, they can go into the deep dive. They need to be continuously guided by the domain experts. Now, this was not the norm in Silicon Valley or in the, in the software industry. It used to be that you would take requirements, then vanish into the woods, and come out with something. And then everybody's like, this is not what I asked for. <laughs> we all know that. So the way out of it is to really meet daily. That's the cost that you have to pay to make these things work. So it's agile and so forth. So those are now well-established methodologies. It works. I wouldn't say it's the best, but it works. Another question. No, no questions. All right, Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Last chance, no questions? All right, everybody's hungry. Well, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. If you'd like to learn any more about my company, uh, we're over at booth 308. We have some information there. And then these folks be around. I think we're eating lunch with everybody, so feel free to come and pick our brain. So enjoy the rest of the conference. Nice meeting you all.